you ma'am to take it further thank you richa i welcome respected seniors and dear friends to this session of learn simply learn simply is a platform where a very precise and crisp information is given by experts in their field who are doing pioneer work and extraordinary work in their field and today uh, this is started by dr kavita bapat ma'am i feel privileged to introduce her she was president of indore society president of breast committee vice president yes. west zone foxy and she believes that let's grow together with lot of great ideas fun and laughter and learn simply is simply a reflection of this thinking and personality uh, i request so uh, dr bapat madam to introduce dr kuldeep singh sir thank you so you. much thank you so much thank you please put a, uh, a cv of dr uh, kuldeep singh sir ji and the most important point is the learn simply is taking a tremendous popularity day by day and most i have seen into the youtube and today we are having a lovely guest of ours we cannot call him a guest he is our own person he is an exceptional individual and a very good friend of ours and who has made a significant impact in the field of ultrasound education and he truly deserves the praise and recognition for his dedication and achievements Uh, basically i just love the commitment of teaching he is having so much many people learn from you this thing as evidenced by many talks he has given awards he has received and the most important is a testament of his skills and a passion in this field and additionally his contribution to the field through their writing sharing his techniques internationally also so many places he has been and a demonstrated his keenness in advancing ultrasound education and improving patient care and around the world so the dr kuldeep uh, singh ji is basically overall an outstanding teacher and a leader in the field of education and thank you so much today that given the consent to have a dialogue with me and your contributions are undoubtedly made the positive impact on the countless individuals and today's subject is also um, very good and important that the sono embryology a specialized area of ultrasound and it innovates the study of developing embryo and the fetus basically and several nonsense in this field is important so over to you i'll ask few questions and people will like to uh, you will like to uh, the listener crisp and the smart answers from you and so though it's a complex subject sir but uh, a specialized training and expertise is always needed for the madam so before we start so first number one is welcome sir so should we start with a few questions so that you can answer perfect i i would just uh, add on with the things this tuesday tea time i've been following it up last time dr tank was there and i've been uh, following it up with dr suchitra pandit also when we had a, a portion over there also when we were talking on uh, eclampsia so it's always good fun and i love the idea of that you finish a thing in half an hour's time so that then we don't have lengthy lengthy talks on one and a yes. half to two hours because we we just need few take home messages so rather than spending that much time it's always good thank you dr jyoti karande for uh, joining in as well that that's really lovely of you thank over you, to you dr kavita thank you so much so we start and i'm really happy to have you today as usual as normal so uh, just to tell and ask the uh, it should be to the our audience should know that before a scan what all should be one looking for see the ultrasound is a very though it has been taught it has been thoroughly we are discussing and everything but still few things which is a take home also take work also so before a scan what all should be looking for sir before we start a scan what is very very important is you should have a proper referral slip you right. should be looking in for filling up your pcp ndt forms right. because that is very very important we we can talk about clinical biochemical family history patient history but if we are going to falter in any of these we are into trouble right. so apart from that before you start a scan take a history if if somebody is just doing a scan there will be many of you just be doing a scan if yeah. you doing your own practice and practicing ultrasound yes you would be aware but otherwise definitely make sure make that extra effort look in in the notes the referral slip what's the previous history what's the beta hcg like and does the patient have any symptoms whatsoever okay so the most important point whenever the patient comes it's our responsibility to look all the referral forms and the 
a patient history and everything. So, sir, how do you say that how soon one can see the pregnancy? It's a very common question to the all the OBGYN, though it's a very undergraduate or the practicing OBGYN, think about it. But it's a very difficult for most of them when to refer the patient and get the sonography done. So, how soon one can see a pregnancy in a sonography? The, the problem is the patient comes to you with a urine test for pregnancy or the moment the urine test is positive, it's expected that you would be seeing a pregnancy. Okay. That's not the case. It's always has to be correlated with the beta HCG and we all have discriminatory zones around 1500 to 2000. So the moment the beta HCG value is above that, that is when you really need the whole thing that, okay, if I do not see a pregnancy, if the patient is not bleeding, it has to be, or it should be an ectopic unless and until proved otherwise. So be very careful. It, it's not that jumping onto an ectopic and let's do a laparoscopy or let's let's call in for termination. Yeah. That's why we've chosen this topic. Go step by step. Correct, correct. So as early as possible. And what makes us sure that I am looking at an intrauterine pregnancy? That's another question. When we talk about as soon as we see a pregnancy, but what makes us sure to that I'm looking at an intrauterine pregnancy? Absolutely correct. I'm going to take your permission to share the screen because yes. it's an ultrasound yes. topic. Yeah. So we would be needing to show a few pictures and the videos. Yes, sir. Yeah. I hope the screen is moving and you can yes. all hear me. Yes, sir. Right. So the moment you're looking at an intrauterine pregnancy, uh, you would be having a few indirect signs. The few indirect signs would be that you would be having an asymmetrical thickening of the endometrium. So it could be anterior or posterior. When you're not looking at a pregnancy or what you could be looking at, if there is some confusion and you want to be very, very sure, just switch on your color for a very few seconds and looking for any comet sign meaning a thin uh, stream of blood going into one of the specific areas. Otherwise, the short, short sign, if you can see over here, this is what we call the intradecidual sign. That's the cavity over there, and you're looking at a gestational sign. It's not in the cavity. It's located asymmetric. This is in the anterior endometrium. Okay. Secondly, if you need to be looking at, that's going to be displacing the cavity and the earlier one was an intra-decidual sign. This is a double decidual sac sign, and you'll start looking at a yolk sac. The gestational sac can be seen as early as four and a half weeks on a transvaginal, and this portion of yolk sac can be seen from five and a half to six weeks onwards. So yolk sac at five and a half and four, that is, yes, sir. Just is pregnancy, we can see at four and a half. Am I right, sir? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, there's and, some and, disturbance. And, there's some disturbance. Dr. Richa, if you could mute yourself. G. Yeah. So, uh, anything anything like that, that the, uh, which we are, any point which you really want to add over here regarding, I'm looking at intrauterine pregnancy other than these two signs or anything else? Well, the next sign that you're going to be looking at is the embryo with a uh, cardiac activity and then I posted in the Sono School groups as well. You yeah. could be looking at a double bleb sign with the embryo in between. So these yeah. are the factors that tell me I'm comfortable. Normal cardiac activity, which we're going to be discussing later, yeah, yeah. one knows we're looking at a normal pregnancy. Amazing. So, sir, so what are some common techniques basically to assess the fetal heart rate? In the ultrasound, and can you tell me about the what is the good fetal health? This is because at this time, patient wants to know sub hai, everything is okay. So, being a simple, we are it's a just a program for a just simply, we are not talking something very uh, high profile thing, but just a basic thing. What common techniques for the assessing the fetal heart rate, sir? The, the best technique and the most commonest technique is eyeballing. You can see the heart beating, show it to the patient. What you're yeah. not supposed to be doing is never use color or Doppler to make the patient hear the heartbeat, especially in early pregnancy, yes. because that's something very common mistake that we all do. And that's really not good. The other thing which we can do and figure out is by the M mode, which is going yeah. to tell us about the heartbeat. So you can oh. see all these waves over here. And depending on what you've chosen, you can choose 
from one or two heartbeats and figure it out. Okay. From six to eight weeks per uh, the weeks, it's going to be 100 to 130 beats per minute is regarded as normal. The moment it's more than eight weeks, a heartbeat should be more than 130 beats per minute. Less than that, you're going to be terming it as bradycardia. And how we're going to be using all that is going to be coming up in a few slides. Correct. So uh, yeah, I, this is the one way of assessing the fetal heart sound and not using the color over there at such early stage. Uh, am I right? And, any, and, any yeah, and, and the spectral Doppler. Because yeah. when one gets into the patient is going to ask, can heartbeat sun sakte? No. Uh -huh. Always tell them at this stage, no. When you yeah. come back at your 11 to 14 week scan, we'll definitely uh -huh. make you listen to the heartbeat. Correct, correct. That's great. And any sign of the ultrasound at this time that we have found out that it's a nearly a pregnancy loss, what should be the signs we'll look for at See, this stage? Absolutely. If you're looking at from your four to 10 weeks and we have specific set criteria, what yeah. you're looking at is if you're looking at a crown rump length of more than seven millimeters, yeah. you're not seeing a heartbeat, you know it's trouble. You're yeah. looking at a mean sac diameter and make sure that you take three measurements in two planes, measure inner to inner. And if you still do not see, you know you're looking at trouble. See such a big embryo, you're not looking at... We know this is a pregnancy loss. Okay. But if it is, let's say, four millimeters or five millimeters, benefit of doubt to be given, and you're going to be calling the patient back again after a week. You're okay. looking at a huge gestational sac. MSD definitely more than 25 millimeters. You're not seeing a yolk sac or an embryo. Okay. So we know we're looking at trouble over here. Okay. So for the early pregnancies, all these are the few features which we can elicit to find it out that we are heading towards the trouble. Am I right? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and, so. and you need to be cautious because what I see is three millimeters, four millimeters, and okay, let's terminate because we're not seeing a heartbeat. They mm -hmm. come back after a week and there's a heartbeat. So try and avoid such situations. It's not that only IVF pregnancies are precious. Each and every baby is precious for the parents. You need to be watching out. There is no harm in calling them back again after a week. Correct, correct. So uh, uh, we have to do it again once or we once we have diagnosed that it's a nearly a pregnancy loss and we are troubled, do we have to evaluate it as early as possible or uh, uh, we have to say it and confirm it at the same time? See, if, if we have these findings, more than 7 millimeters, more than 25 millimeters, then we show off. Or two weeks ago, you've seen a gestational sac. We did not show yolk sac, still not showing it. You know it's trouble. You saw yeah. a patient 11 days ago and you saw that there was, I'll just put in that slide, that yeah. more than 11 days, you were seeing a yolk sac, but you still do not see a heartbeat. You know that's trouble. So these are okay. the newer definitions that have come up. So you need to be watchful. Okay. Serial ultrasounds, always important, not only for FGR, but for sonar embryology also, as and when required. Okay. Okay. So gestational sac, and in a, what is the correlation? We should be go for it. Am I right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what should be the possibilities when we think about and tell about that how many percent of chances that this pregnancy is going to be, we are in a trouble or we are not in a trouble with a seeing the gestational sac and a yolk. Are the possibilities should be? Yeah, yes. Yeah. The, the, the same thing that I showed you the three uh, portions. If you're looking at less than seven millimeters, yeah. There is no heartbeat, see them again. But that does not mean there is trouble. It can. Yeah. But these are the things that are going to tell you. If you're looking at a mean sac diameter minus the crown rump length, if it's less than five millimeters, or if by eyeballing you see that the gestational sac is full of the embryo, hmm. you know you're looking at an oligoamniotic sac. The interval growth is poor. There's poor sac growth. There's a large yolk sac. It's a large or a floppy amniotic sac we know we're looking at trouble. If you see over here, that's the gestational sac. And I, I hope my arrow is moving and everyone can see that. Yeah, yeah, that's the yes. embryo. So you feel as if this gestational sac is full of the embryo. We know that is a oligoamniotic sac. Does not mean it's trouble. It means be watching out for so that there is no trouble later. Rather than calling them back again at 11 to 14 weeks, it's much better that you call them a little earlier. That's the cardiac activity. You know, this is such a big gestational sac. This is definite. 
bradycardia. Mm -hmm. yes. If you see, these are the factors that you need to be. If you're looking at less than six weeks, 100 to 130 is fine. But if it's less than 80 beats per minute, we sure we're looking at trouble. Seven weeks, less than 100 beats per minute, we're looking at trouble. Be watchful for, these are the signs which can tell us that we're looking at trouble. Large yolk sac. Mm -hmm. It's a twin gestational sac. We're seeing a heartbeat, but this went on for a missed abortion. This went off correctly because the yolk sac was fine. You see a large yolk sac, don't jump the gun, there is problem. There could be a problem, evaluate that. If more than six weeks after the last menstrual period and you do not see, just be watchful. It could be a delayed conception. And in the amnion, if you do not see an embryo, that's what we call an empty amnion sign. Yes. Be watchful for. So these are the few signs which we talk about. Same with a, an eccentric position and a location of gestational sac is also important. Am I right? Absolutely. See, yeah, if yeah. you're seeing for these things, this is normal, comfortable. Yeah. This might lead to trouble. Call them back again. In the uterus, you're looking at that there is an abnormally located gestational sac. It's more towards the side. Again, always does not mean trouble. These are the possibilities. You could be looking at angular, interstitial. You could yeah. be looking at a coronal. So mm -hmm. if I find the gestational sac here, I know it should have been here. But as long as we're looking at in the endometrium with a thin layer of endometrium lateral to the gestational sac, a thick myometrium lateral to the gestational sac, I'm comfortable. Correct. Correct. If you see over here. And it's not that you always need a 3D. That's a transfer section. I know it's not bang in the center. It's on the side with a thick myometrium more than five millimeters. I purposely not put in too much of theory. If you see over here, it's in the portion, myometrial portion of the fallopian tube. And that's what you call an interstitial ectopic or an interstitial pregnancy. See over here, you'll be going on the side, nothing over here. And the moment you reach the side, you see a thin myometrium. The endometrium is not around the gestational sac. Few more examples. Angular. This is interstitial ectopic. Yes. And then the third one where you can see for is we're looking at in the fundus of a bicornuate or a septate uterus. That's what you name a coronal pregnancy. Yeah. Why you need to know about all this is because the moment you see angular and you say we need to terminate, no. We need to be careful so that if it's growing laterally, then might be a termination is required. Usually it grows more medially. Yes. That's on the right side. Left side is full of the decidual reaction. In fact, yesterday only I got a photograph from a doctor from Bhubaneswar and they were worried what exactly is this? Is it an interstitial one outside? That was a separate picture altogether. Mm -hmm. It was a septate uterus and they later confirmed it by doing a transverse scan. They didn't have a 3D, but they did it by looking at a transverse section. Correct. So, so we are also worried about nowadays about the cervical pregnancy, the scar pregnancy, and worried about the, what is the abortion in a progress or not. These are the way that, uh, are there some, these we, dilemmas are there because uh, scar pregnancy has become a little popular nowadays, probably because of uh, very expert people like you are doing sonography and uh, it's a man-made thing. I always call it because of the previous scar is because of more and more cesarean section we do. So do you like to uh, throw some light on this cervical pregnancy, scar pregnancy and what is the abortion in progress over there? Is there? See, what, what happens is the moment we have a cervical pregnancy, the next question comes in all the CMEs is why cannot be that the it's the gestational sac which oh. has come down. So yeah. there are a few features. If you see an empty uterus, or uh, our uh, glass uterus, balloon cervical canal. Uh, you're looking at a sac in the cervix, a closed internal loss, and you're looking at flow around it. Otherwise, uh, the biggest pathognomic sign is if you see a cardiac activity in a gestational sac below the internal loss, it's a cervical pregnancy. Yes. But if you're looking at an abortion in process, same yeah. thing, you'll see a sac, but there'll be no vascularity around. The sac could be irregular, 
the os could be open and when you're doing a sliding sign you pushing it the, the gestational sac could change shape and get pushed when it's a cervical one it will not get pushed so if you see over here that's a cervical pregnancy yes cervical pregnancy and the same goes for a scar pregnancy yes when you see an isthmocele in a non gravid uterus the same way with the least pressure over there or the least resistance the gestational sac tends to go inside the scar niche so you're going to look at plenty of vascularity you're going to look at that there is a cardiac activity inside also if it hasn't formed a mass you're going to see that the cervical canal is empty and it's anterior to it if you see over here that's the cervical canal that's the gestational sac and you're looking at a thin scar area and that's the beaking over there yes plenty of vascularity seen mm. so basically the location the location is going to tell you in the cervical canal think of two things abortion in process of cervical if it's anterior to it patient has had a previous scar you're going to be thinking of a scar pregnancy so true so the scar pregnancy at the right time if it is diagnosed then the treatment should will be better other than this but the history is also important when we talk about the abortion in progress or there is only a cervical pregnancy am i right some bleeding or some stability absolutely there. absolutely yeah, 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 yeah. and when the the point comes in the what will be the right time to diagnose the tubal ectopic number one and when to suspect and when to diagnose because uh most of the time patient comes to us when there is a severe pain and initially uh, not being done the sonography not being done and they they go with the pain and everything shock and then do the sonography and everything so but if it's a tubal ectopic not ruptured what we suspect and how to diagnose it that's important if you're looking at a beta hcg more yeah. than the discriminatory zone patient yeah. is not bleeding please make sure that there should not be any ectopic the yeah. side which has the corpus luteum you're going to be suspecting more over there yeah. if you're looking at a gestational sac in the tubal area and the adnexa with a yolk sac with a cardiac activity or no you're absolutely sure but it does not always happen so what yeah. you're going to be seeing is you could be seeing a mass over there yeah. so if you're looking at a yolk sac and a gestational sac it's a bagel sign if yeah. you're looking at a mass that's what you call a blob sign or you could be looking at plenty of free fluid so if you're seeing free fluid and you know it's echogenic it's blood with the patient sinking and the patient symptoms are such that she has severe pain then you know you're looking at a ruptured ectopic so if you're seeing yeah. there are two ring of fires the one mm -hmm. of them is a corpus luteum the other is a gestational sac yeah. corpus luteum gestational sac so you need to be watchful and if you see over here you started to see free fluid over there so it's very important to diagnose tubal ectopic and to differentiate with a corpus luteal cyst sometimes previously when the diagnosis was never used to be the proper one the paper patient being uh, oh man this the surgeries for the corpus luteal cyst have also been uh, been seen into the surgical uh, the laparoscopy only so it's very important to diagnose tubal ectopic do you think the molar pregnancies are that common now or we are able to diagnose it as early as possible see the complete molar pregnancies were able to diagnose very very early when we're um, looking at basically all this that we're looking at this sort of a pattern Okay. so this is not a difficulty the problem comes in a partial mole so that's where you need to be looking at that the placenta might be showing such features and you're looking at a fetus which is going small and there is oligoamnios as well that's when you need to think about a cystic placenta always should be suspicious for these things correct correct But about the molar pregnancy i think you are doing so many sonographies when we were the students it used to be diagnosed when they come to 20 weeks 24 yes. weeks and what not they have because of the advancements into the uh, sonography in the early stage and sono embryology is one of the very good subject being over there so molar pregnancies i think we diagnose as early as possible but we are not able to confirm the molar pregnancy diagnosis because we don't do the um, genetic uh, things and we are like that the problem is i think molar molar pregnancy is change scenario with a early diagnosis 
but still it's important we should know about. And anything we like to tell about or a clue you can give when the which type of the twin it is and what about the twin pregnancy when we talk about. See, the moment you're looking at uh, two gestational sacs, you're very, very clear. If you see the left upper, you're looking at a dichorionic diamniotic. Correct. You're looking at such a thin membrane, this, you okay, you're sure of that you're looking at monochorionic diamniotic. Correct. The best way to figure out is single gestational sac. If you're looking at two yolk sacs, it usually should be a monochorionic diamniotic because two yolk sacs would mean that. So that's a nice chart that I always follow. But okay. the best is at your 11 to 14 week scan, looking for the lambda sign, looking for the T sign that decides which type of a twin pregnancy is it. And always be patient, never be in a rush, and never, never feel if there is a problem, always refer that for a second opinion so that we don't make mistakes. Correct. Correct. It's very important because it's early diagnosis and with the advances of ART clinics and everything, twins pregnancy were there. Though they have, have a good ART laws over there not to have it, still it's an important point to diagnose as at early as possible. So the last way that I like to ask when you talk about the sonoembryology, that the most important question which comes is, and we have when and where we should use the color droplet in the first trimester. See, when you're doing a scan in early pregnancy, four to 10 weeks, you are not supposed to be switching on your color on the fetus. You, if you want to look in for corpus luteum flow, yes, for sure. You want to be doing your uterine arteries for any reason for recurrent pregnancy losses, you might. But again, it does not have any value. Okay. So, and when you're going to come from your 11 to 14 weeks, can the next step, you can do an ultrasound, looking at the ductus sphenosis, looking in for tricuspid regurgitation, but always and always follow the principle of A-L-A-R-A, ALARA, that is as low as reasonably achievable. You, it's not that you're switching on your color box on the fetus and let it remain there and you're chatting here and there, never. If you really want your machine also to be fit and fine, if you're not doing a scan, keep it always on a frozen mode. That's always better. So these are the small, small things that you can always do. 11 to 14, you might use it on the fetus. Before that, you do not need to. For looking at the heartbeat, there's so many times when the doctors tell me or the delegates tell me that can we just switch on color just to see the heartbeat? Well, you'll have to lower down the uh, velocities too much. You do not need to be doing it because either you're seeing it or call back the patient later. Correct, correct. So the role of color doctor, anything which you want to talk about the non in this uh, sonoembryology as a concluding remarks over here. So I'll be happy that we have already most covered the one we diagnosed the early pregnancy, what should be the scan referred one, what is the twin cervical scar in a short way, because it's a very crisp knowledge sharing platform. Uh, you can talk on the subject for, I think, uh, hours together and teach people, but it's a, it's a, in learn simply, it's our ideas like that. So anything in a concluding remarks, you'll love to want to say something about it. The, 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 message which I'm going to be giving is never shy away for doing a transabdominal scan. Always start off. You could be missing out on something higher. So if you're seeing the patient for the first time, do a transabdominal scan and then jump onto a TVS. Don't straight away do a TVS because you could be missing out. It's not that routinely you're going to be missing out, but why have those patients suffer those 10 to 15% if you can figure out and do a good job? Filling up the bladder does not take too long and you always need to be patient. Never jump the gun in terms of that, oh no, this is the diagnosis, this is the diagnosis. Keep your antennas on, keep your possibilities on, and always and always be watchful for what you're telling the patient, what you're writing in the report. If you're suspecting something, please write it in the report. Finally, that's what's going to be the most useful piece of paper that's going to be there if things go wrong. Correct. Thank you so much for the crisp and everything uh, you have talked about. And once again, the Tuesdays at Tea Time, which I always call as a platform, is a dedicated, we call it, for the sharing the insights and the take work messages. Crisp knowledge on the various subjects through the conversation and the leaders and experts like you, we always love to no, have. No, this is, I, I would always say that and this is all the best for your coming endeavors and Thank you're doing you so such much. a great job. We, we're all enjoying this Tuesday Tea Time. 
and the uh, programs that we are attending of yours. Thank you so thank much. You, um, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we everyone over here today, it's our goal to provide practicing OBGYN and to assess the valuable information and the knowledge. And that can grow them professionally and personally. It's my idea about the Learn Simply, crisp knowledge and experts into the field. We can expand the network also and share your perspective also. Thank you so much for being with me and love you all. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Jyoti. Thank you so Thank much. You, Thank you.